Since 2018, uh, the University of Bonn pools expertise on sustainability research across faculties in the trans uh, transdisciplinary research area, innovation and technology for sustainable futures. The TRA organizes the lecture series, Innovation Pathways to Sustainability, as a forum for high profile and internationally visible scientists who are active in academia or at the science policy interface. And we ask speakers to address research opportunities to enhance sustainability in all its dimensions, that means social, environmental, and economic. Uh, speakers are invited to present cutting edge research in the fields of expertise and discuss related future agendas with the audience. And for today's lecture, we have invited Markus Reichstein, and I'm very happy he said yes to give a lecture. And Markus Reichstein is a director of the Biogeochemical Integration Department at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry. And his main research interests revolve around the response and feedback of ecosystems to climatic variability with an earth system perspective, considering coupled carbon, water, and nutrient cycles. Of specific interest is the interplay of climate extremes with ecosystem and societal resilience. And these topics are addressed via a model data integration approach, combining data-driven machine uh, learning with systems modeling, of experimental ground and satellite-based observations. And since, since 2013, Markus Reichstein is professor for global geoecology at the Friedrich Schiller University Jena and founding director uh, at the Michael Stiefel Center Jena for data-driven and simulation science. And he has been serving as lead author of the IPCC serial, uh, special report on climate extremes as member of the German committee Future Earth on Sustainability Research and the Thuringian Panel on Climate. And recent awards include the PSJ Sellers Mid-Career Award by the American Geophysical Union in 2018, an ESC Synergy Grant in 2019, and the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize in 2020. And with this, I hand over to Markus. I, the floor is yours. Okay, yes, thank you <clears throat> actually for the invitation to give this talk and to share my thoughts that are partly also a bit out of my own uh, box of, of research. Uh, so I'm looking forward actually to the, um, to the discussion. Um, yeah, so the whole context of the talk is certainly as probably some of the talks in your, uh, in your series on, on climate change. So I will not, uh, don't want to talk too much about climate change um, itself. But maybe uh, take the opportunity to point you to a very, very new fact sheet that just came out this year from the Leopoldina, where I was um, able to contribute. And just as a reminder, we are living in, in exceptional times. Uh, the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere is much higher than during the last almost 1 million years. Now we are surpassing, uh, four, we have been surpassing already 400 ppms. And uh, the, the COVID crisis actually doesn't change that very much. And that leads, apart from other facts, uh, factors, um, to a change in the, in, in the temperature. And globally, we have already risen more than one degree. And in Germany, uh, already um, two degrees Celsius since 1880. Another thing that we know from physical modeling with high emissions, the warming will continue. And uh, we have this 1.2 or 2 degree target and people sometimes ask, oh, doesn't sound too much. But it is of course very important to know that uh, the warming is not uniform. Uh, the land is warming more strongly than the ocean and the high latitudes are warming uh, more strongly than the low latitudes, as you can see here on the right hand side very clearly in the, in the, in the high uh, emission scenario. What is maybe even more important and often less known um, that it's probably more impactful um, the changes in the water cycle. Uh, and we see here um, projections from the SREX IPCC report um, how, how the water cycle might change in terms of cumulative dry days on the left hand side or soil moisture anomalies on the, on the right hand side. And what is projected there is that in particular areas, areas that are already now semi-arid will possibly uh, become 
um, even drier. And this is a major concern, um, I would say, and, and uh, bigger than just the global mean uh, temperature. Of course, um, the water cycle is also a bit more uncertain to, to model. Um, but the next slide, I want to show you my, one of my favorite plants is a rosemary, as you can, can see and why I'm showing that. First of all, I really love it. I like, like to cook with it. Um, but I show you that for another reason. And the reason is um, it's very hard to grow this in Jena, where I'm now and where I'm working and living. Um, and the reason for that is not the mean temperature or not the mean precipitation, um, but it is um, that every five to 10 years, for example, this year, uh, there's coming the Siberian cold uh, to Jena, quite continental climate here, and comes with minus 20 degrees. And then all the growth that has been uh, accumulated during, during the years before uh, can be killed by this single event of minus, uh, minus 20 degrees. So this is basically, the point is actually that organisms and societies react to, not to average temperatures or average moisture, but rather to extreme events and to the concrete conditions, the weather conditions that are, they are experiencing over their, over their lifetime. That's kind of trivial, but it, it is, um, it is maybe not always really so well uh, considered and it can be very um, directly actually linked uh, to our pathways to sustainability um, in the sense um, that we have also an interaction between our way, way towards the sustainability goal, the sustainable development goals and, and climate extremes in the sense that actually climate extremes endanger uh, the reaching of sustainable development goals. We cannot think of this just as a smooth transition and everything will be nice, but we also need to consider what happens if there are shocks um, happening. And we now have learned that, of course, uh, very, very clearly from the COVID crisis. And this is also definitely much more um, in, the, uh, in the minds of the people. But on the other hand, it is also important that we can actually see that with reaching towards sustainable development goals, we can also strengthen uh, the resilience against climate extremes. These are the green dots here um, that are marked in the, in the pictograms. Like if we have less poverty, higher um, education and, and more equality, these are all factors that uh, can help um, resilience um, against extreme events. Maybe one, uh, one other perspective um, that shows that the, the urgency regarding the, um, the importance of uh, extreme weather is undoubted. The World, World Economic Forum is, is doing this um, risk assessment by expert elicitation. And you can see in the years 15 to 19, extreme weather has been always uh, among the first um, two most likely uh, impacts. And for 2020, it was still on the first. And you see actually all the top five um, um, Hazards were basically uh, related or risks were related to environmental uh, environmental issues. Uh, now, actually, of course, in, in this year again, uh, the consciousness of um, <clears throat> pandemics is of course is of course bigger, but actually, climate is still uh, um, on the top. Um, what complicates the whole thing um, is that climate extremes are actually a moving uh, target. Here is a, a figure that um, shows um, that, for example, heat and drought. Uh, a lot of those events have actually become more severe or more likely to occur through climate change. So we are not in a stationary system uh, anymore, but um, we have changing magnitude and, and frequency. And that actually means in terms of our regulations and our reactions that existing norms that have been useful um, to cope with, with these kind of things and beliefs may not hold anymore um, in the future. Another uh, complication, um, is, is, is the so-called compound and cascading events, and which can be often almost a bit uh, counterintuitive. And just two examples. <clears throat> um, you may remember the Southern California 2018 uh, floods, and they were actually caused by a dry event, if you want, forest fires that actually cleared the canopy, opened the soil. And then on top of that, a wet event, heavy rain, <clears throat> that then caused uh, the erosion and, and the mud flood. Or similarly, the Northern California 2017 fires um, 
were actually first caused uh, by, by wet winter, which caused dense vegetation. So a lot of fuel that can burn then a dry and hot summer, which desiccated the fuel, uh, the biomass. Uh, and in addition, then as a third component, strong winds that then altogether led to these cas catastrophic fires. And of course, um, these cascading, uh, these kind of cascades that bring very strong events um, are first of all hard to anticipate and hard to model, uh, but then have also very, very large um, impact. And these impacts are also relevant, as you can see here, in highly industrialized um, countries. Another example about uh, a cascading effects that really <clears throat> show also how this goes across different systems um, is, is a Russian heat wave, um, where, of course, every, everything started in the, in the weather and climate system. We have climate change uh, that made this event more likely, but we had also uh, a specific um, omega uh, uh, weather situation with, with, a, with a high, a stable high that then caused this nice weather <clears throat> which uh, then caused uh, heat wave um, and drought um, over um, that area, leading to vegetation stress. And the dried out vegetation again was very susceptible to fire. So we had strong uh, forest fires that then caused um, air pollution, uh, in particular, of course, important in the, in, in the cities. And only the, actually the combination and synergy of the air pollution together with the, with the heat wave. So two stressors actually caused then this strong uh, mortality um, that um, affected more than 10,000 uh, people in, in Russia. Another causal pathway is of course um, the, um, the harvest, the crop failures that happen uh, with such an event. In this case, the wheat um, harvest were severely um, affected and um, and this uh, then had um, impacts on, on the prices, uh, global, global wheat prices. Um, I think that is pretty well established, although this is really outside my own um, domain. Uh, and then one can certainly, or it's certainly plausible um, that then this, uh, this kind of economic effects are also risk multiplier or modifier regarding uh, social instabilities. Um, that then, for example, led to the Arab Spring, although this is, of course, not, uh, not easy to prove. But the main point that I, I would like um, to make is um, that we really need an, a system view when we consider uh, the impact of extreme events. And we have basically these three major systems, atmosphere, geosphere, the model physical system, then the biosphere, <clears throat> biological systems, and then the anthroposphere. And we have cascading impacts indirect or direct. And of course, uh, we also have cascades within of each of the systems. These are the small circles. And then we have feedbacks go going back. And um, I believe we need to have this um, uh, system view, uh, but also this indicated with the data, we really need to have also empirical evidence to see what kind of um, uh, dynamics are actually happening. And on, on top of that, there are a lot of important aspects. Uh, different time scales are involved, different spatial scales are involved. And um, then also socio psychological uh, uh, aspects like perception, valuation, and beliefs that also uh, um, determine uh, to some extent how the reaction of societies will be. And that will depend on where and when and why certain extremes happened. Uh, maybe just uh, two more examples about the counterintuitive uh, effects that can happen through these uh, system interactions. Um, so one is basically climate and biological. It's a very recent one. Um, so we had, uh, for example, now, now in April, um, the uh, cold snaps in, in April, one of the coldest Aprils over the last uh, 50 years in, in Germany. And that damaged a lot uh, the wine in particular in France. Uh, so it's uh, calamité agricole. So it's a really strong, strong effect. And this one might not necessarily expect uh, because the climate is warming. And so what well, frost days are not that important. But, um, but the point is actually that the biology reacts also to the climate warming. So we have warm March, March days, and we had that this year. We have an advanced vegetation phenology, so the, the plants are flowering. Then we have the, the April frost, the late frost, and this thing can cause, uh, cause the damages. And um, it's, it's pretty likely that this kind of chain is um, in this case can be attributed to, to climate change also because on the one end we have uh, the overall warming in spring, but then also 
um, effects uh, with a jet stream that makes some of these um, cold events um, more, more likely. Um, an, an example that is a bit more, more positive and involves uh, the societal uh, realm is a bit hypothetical, but um, let's say the data itself is, is, has, has empirical evidence. Um, and that is about um, the effects of drought uh, on, on, on wasting among, among children in, in East Africa. And uh, you would expect, well, the more severe the drought is, the stronger are the SE impact. But what you can see here, uh, the strongest impacts are actually with moderate drought. And then uh, when it's severe, um, it, it, it is going down. <clears throat> and the hypothetical uh, interpretation of this that we also have system interaction here between the natural systems and the uh, societal systems. So first of all, of course, more drought would uh, means uh, malnutrition risk, and that means wasting uh, and possibly even uh, mortality. But on the other hand, the drought severity, and particularly if it's monitored, uh, also changes the risk perception by national, but also international um, bodies. Uh, and that can then trigger help, more help, and then we uh, we basically get a negative feedback that the help can actually have an impact on, on, on reducing the effects um, of, of malnutrition. So these are just a couple of examples where really the system view um, is, is important. And of course, the system view is also um, is perceived and is also has been also analyzed again by the World Economic Forum regarding global uh, systemic risks. Um, and here, uh, also extreme weather and, and natural environmental risk play an important role here, this um, a triangle with the uh, water crisis and overall climate action failure that then <clears throat> links um, to socioeconomic um, aspects like involuntary migration, social instability, and failure to govern actually the, um, um, the society, which can then lead to regional or, or state collapse. So this is also pretty well, at least uh, the risk is, is seen, it's not, uh, it's not uh, necessarily um, new, uh, the systemic risks. One, uh, maybe, again, empirical evidence that is quite plastic on, on this is um, that, for example, we have a strong concentration, if you want, of the deaths from natural hazard-related uh, disasters in, in the top um, 30 fragile states, which is uh, much much less than 20% of, um, of the states, so um, the concentration in these uh, fragile states. So it is it is really important um, to link actually this these three uh, three major major frameworks: the Paris Agreement that really on, focuses on climate, the Sustainable Development Goals <clears throat> that, that is broad and trying to address many dimensions of sustainable development, including societal ones. Uh, and then uh, the Sendai framework that is focusing on, on, on disaster risk reduction. I think if we bring that together, we basically will have risk aware sustainable development. And that's something we should really, really strive for. It has been also um, acknowledged, for example, by the global um, risk um, assessment re report on, on risk. But it is interesting, uh, and well, uh, we developed these, these things before Corona. Um, that, uh, that that risk awareness actually still needs to be uh, be improved. For example, if you look into the German sustainability strategy, the word climate extremes and related words actually only appeared three times and only in one of the resorts uh, in the traffic infrastructure, the digital affairs resort. Disaster only was once and only in one resort. Um, and the and risk was actually eight times, but really inconsistent meanings. So no, no clear actually uh, framework. Another example that uh, Chinese colleagues actually mentioned to me is this concept of smart cities, which can contribute to sustainable development. But again, the vulnerability of, of these um, structures uh, is obviously not really strongly considered. I mentioned in one of, at one of the first slides already, um, of course, the situation has fortunately changed uh, on the one hand uh, through a, I think, quite successful consultation process via the Wissenschafts uh, Platform Nachhaltigkeit, but of course also triggered by the fact that we saw an extreme event, not one, not a climate extreme, but a, the pandemic, as you all know, and, um, and that triggered actually a lot of new um, 
perception and conscience regarding uh, the importance of resilience and, uh, and resilient development. So actually the, this year's um, development of the German strategy has already is already much improved. Um, so this is good. On the other hand, uh, is of course um, still very uh, challenging and um, systemic risk modeling and trying to understand systemic risk is um, very, very difficult. Um, and I would actually argue that we need more of these uh, system modeling um, approaches like has been done here by uh, Yaza uh, colleagues, which is based on an agent-based models and brought together with a lot of data where on the one can differentiate between the direct risk, for example, <clears throat> of a flood in this case, and then the interactions between financial institutions, governance, firm, and, and the households uh, that then causes through these interactions um, indirect risk also. And, and here in this case, a combined uh, risk is actually higher than just the direct one. I think we need actually more of those, um, of those efforts. Um, if you want to, um, we have actually just had a comment on, on, on this, uh, more floods, fires, and cyclones plan for domino effects on sustainability goals. Um, you, uh, if you are interested in that, just read these two pages, are relatively lightweight, and we are would be also happy in, in interacting. So we are thinking about that a lot in our uh, risk car knowledge action network on the emergent risk and extreme events, uh, which is kind of governed by, by these four um, larger um, programs. Um, we have very lively discussions. There are a couple of working groups that all try to address the systemic aspect of their topics. For example, critical infrastructures, uh, learning from the past, um, early warning, and, and so on and so forth. So just go to the webpage if you're interested and you can um, get in contact um, or subscribe also to the mailing list. But um, in the title, I uh, said I would also talk about artificial, artificial intelligence. So what's the role of data science and artificial intelligence? Um, first of all, um, so that's actually a field that, I, that it's pretty cl close to my own uh, research um, in, in the geosciences. And um, one point that we actually wanted to make actually more to the machine learning community is that actually machine learning can be very, very, and deep learning in particular, very important for geoscientific um, research. Because these classical tasks like object classification of cats and dogs is analog to pattern classification like hurricanes or droughts or atmospheric rivers in, in the geosystem or super resolution, uh, trying to reconstruct faces is very similar to downscaling of climate, um, climate information. Or in the uh, more dynamic case, video prediction is a hot topic, predicting what's going on in a, in, in a video scheme, for a, a scene, for example, in sports, directly links to uh, short-term forecasting of clouds, weather patterns, or, uh, or, or how the biosphere is, um, is re reacting to those. And last but not least, language translation, where language context and the context of what has been said before is very important. Maps, again, di very directly to uh, dynamic time uh, series modeling. So, for sure, AI has an important uh, role to play just from a scientific um, point of view. And it is meanwhile also exploding and, uh, and, and strongly um, exploited. Um, there's been another nice review by Sanadal, um, which basically tried to uh, classify where I, I can actually help for risk reduction and management. There's a large body of literature regarding um, <clears throat> response uh, to disasters, high resolution remote sensing, uh, provide first aid and humanitarian assistance is one of, of examples, but also for mitigation preparedness and then also the longer term recovery process. Um, taking a little bit of different angle, I, I would actually argue from the methodological point of view, maybe use of machine learning can be really helpful in three domains and I will uh, briefly uh, address those. Um, on the one hand, is understanding causes and conditions for impacts and disasters. So looking at past impacts, so more the understanding. Then the prediction and forecast, and particular local forecasts, um, and particular also non-physical impacts that are not so easy to model physically. And then last but not least, also communication. So on the first one, I can give you an example from, from the, from the uh, impact modeling or, of natural systems of the biosphere. So first of all, we start actually with detecting 
anomalies with these rich source of information from Earth observation that is spatial, temporally dense, can be organized in these um, cubes, uh, Earth system data cubes, how we call them. So it's a multivariate data set. And one can actually, first of all, ask, okay, under which, when are those variables strange and unnormal in, the, in their constellations? One can then uh, visualize that when in space and time this has been the case. So here we have 2010, uh, the year and, uh, and Europe and, and Eurasia. Um, and you see here basically these blobs are then these time space blobs or regions uh, where an extreme event has been detected. And you may guess, so this is again um, the, the Russian heat wave that has been here detected just from the observational data without any other um, input. Of course, the Russian heat wave is also relatively easy to detect. But um, what is actually interesting, we can then look into, uh, into the impact. Also, one interesting thing is here that while on the left hand side you see a pretty uniform weather condition, it was really warm, really hot. The impact on the biosphere was actually a bit dichotomous uh, with, with strong negative effects here in the southern part, but actually positive effects in, 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 the, in the northern part. So, again, this is just derived from data. Um, and we can do that globally, or we did that actually globally. And, and see that actually these climatological extreme events occur all over the world, um, but they also can have positive or negative effects here on the uh, vegetation <clears throat> productivity. And the next step is, of course, then to ask um, why is it positive and when is negative? Maybe we can uh, change the management uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and one can just look at that in plots. Uh, for example, looking at temperature and moisture, and one can see, yeah, under, under warm, very warm conditions and drier conditions, there are more red spots, but it's not really uh, so clear. And there, it's important to bring in more <clears throat> dimensions, uh, and that's where one cannot do easy plots anymore, and where machine learning again comes into play to explain those uh, those patterns. And in this case, we use the um, XGBoost um, algorithm together with, with Lime to see what, what are the important features. And what turns out is that actually the land cover, the vegetation itself is an important determinant on, uh, on whether um, we have positive effects like with forests tend to actually be more resilient and um, respond more positive, at least immediately. While for example, the, the duration of the extreme event uh, seems to be an important negative um, factor. Um, an important aspect uh, are also um, lag, um, lag effects, and uh, particularly if we talk about society, this is just something that just started. Again, keeping maybe the system diagram in, in mind, uh, we were actually looking at extreme events in the atmosphere and in the biosphere. These are these kind of blobs and how they are spatial temporally connected, the blue and, and, and the red ones. Uh, and then at the same time, look uh, at the MDOT disaster database and, and from the polygons there understand where actually societal impacts have been recorded <clears throat> and that's pretty hard job um, but for example what we um, what we see um, is for example that um, during a reported drought or in, in the disaster database actually the different variables here atmospheric variables it doesn't matter too much now what it is are pretty normal but actually what we see is that before the reported drought um, we uh, had um, this kind of um, variables with very strong reductions, for example, here in blue on, on the productivity. So we really need to look at these um, um, lagged and, and changed effects. Um, it's also uh, looking at macroeconomic societal data. Machine learning can also help, uh, help a lot. So one can actually do dimensionality reduction to bring, for example, the World Bank, the more than 500 World Bank indicators into a few interpretable uh, dimensions. Um, where we can see, for example, see how Haiti um, developed along these dimensions or, or Greece. This is, of course, not caused by a natural event, but 2008, um, the crisis, how, how actually then the second dimension goes uh, down from, from a previous increase. So actually the machine learning methods are there. And I think the limiting factors are actually the fairness of the data and actually the resolution of the data because statewide uh, information is not always um, the most um, useful. Um, for, for interpretation. Um, so the second part is prediction and uh, <clears throat> forecast of impacts, where I can help um, a lot. 
and this has been also recognized in particular by the humanitarians. Uh, Forecast-based anticipatory early action is a very, very important thing. Um, in this report, they have found that they can basically save, or uh, let's say the revenue of, of $1 invested in forecast-based financing uh, yields actually um, $3 um, dollars, um, saved in, 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 in beneficiary uh, losses. Um, an example um, that, uh, from, uh, from our group that's not directly to le related to that, but to the fact that we can actually use machine learning to do local uh, forecasts um, is, is an example um, here, basically trying to predict landscapes at a very high resolution. So having climate factors, quite core scale climate factors, and then basically downscale the drivers and the impacts at the same time to basically then predict how such a landscape looks like under a certain climate, um, under certain climate conditions. Um, the question is how can one do that and if one can do that. And uh, the result is really that one can, one can do that. Um, so here's one predicted landscape uh, uh, row and one, um, one one original one, and I actually don't remember myself now which one is one. So the predicted is the upper one. They are not exactly the same, but the statistics of those landscapes are very, very similar. So it is possible with, with convolutional neural, neural networks um, that actually count for, for a spatial um, context and spatial structure. And I didn't want to go into too much technical detail, but, but the conditional Generative adversarial network that we use actually is clearly better than baselines that didn't use any spatial um, context here. And at the end, uh, this is just again a method that has been developed to do jobs like this. So filling um, hand-drawn uh, pictures with something then that looks like a handbag uh, in this case. And I believe the uh, application that I showed you is, has maybe a little bit more, uh, more sense. And the, and the next step is, of course, not doing that for average landscapes, but rather doing dynamic local impact forecasting. This is something we are actually trying together with three uh, colleagues in the, in the deep cube project in the next three to four years. <clears throat> the idea is basically that we um, start with uh, synoptic data from weather forecasts. Um, and then with uh, artificial intelligence in the same way as I just described, predict the local impact on the one hand, so really on a local scale that cannot be done with dynamic downscaling of the weather and the impact, and then also look at memory and dynamic effects uh, in, in the aftermath of those um, extreme events. I think I'm a little bit uh, bad with time, so this would be a kind of a typically recurrent uh, network approach that one, uh, that one is uh, using here, but I won't go into more um, detail. Um, just wanted for those that are interested, um, okay, maybe just one more example where we can actually see how dynamic uh, this landscape can change, uh, recorded by, by the European Space Agency during the 2018 drought. Within a month, uh, this is a change um, of uh, how the vegetation went from green to brown. And then, of course, we have very strong um, local uh, effects also. And um, currently, there's it, it is a very challenging task. And so we have a challenge out there, EarthNet. 2021. If there are machine learners around, please look at that web page and, and try to um, tackle this, this challenge, for example, Rebana. Um, I didn't talk much about the problem. Of course, we don't really necessarily always get understanding and physical consistency. That's a general problem if you just use deep learning. Uh, we can have a discussion about that if you, if you like. But I would like to make the, the last point where machine learning can help. And I think that's, that's maybe a undervalued thing, it's, it's about communication and visualization. If you're again talking about early early warning, the nice um, figure from Brian Golding and, and colleagues is basically these several valleys of death that one has to cross from an observation, a forecast towards a decision that then helps saving, saving lives. And uh, all of those aspects that concern different disciplines is really, is really important. And here, yeah, or actually in all of those, can uh, machine learning can also play a role. And I just want to make a point, uh, a psychological effect that one can uh, get maybe. There's a nice paper from the group of Benjo that actually 
try to let AI make imagine how a flood would look like for a certain property. And this probably gives a different psychological impact to the people living there than telling them, oh, the water will be two meters above um, normal. So concretization um, of, of, of the impacts. And we have been trying that also out uh, with how actually landscape would look like under a changing climate, um, basically when it's getting drier, uh, drier and, and, and warmer, you see basically the change from a snowy landscape to a very dry landscape. And this again, one can do that, but of course one has to be very cautious because it's a space for time substitution, it's not a real prediction, very careful. But again, for imagining what could happen, I think these kind of things can be good. Uh, then last point, um, I really do, don't want to give um, a naively optimistic view on artificial intelligence. And uh, for example, the, the review paper by Vinuesa shows very clearly and nicely what can be positive and negative impacts. Um, there are a lot of positive ones um, that are related to the things that I mentioned before, but there are also potential negative impacts. The typical problem of bias predictions, particularly when algorithms are transferred from, for example, our, let's say, landscapes to southern landscapes, increase in inequality between countries and within countries because of different abilities to apply AI, increase discrimination stereotypes because AI is very good at learning these kind of uh, things. Um, so one needs to uh, have strategies against that. And also, if, at least if it's centralized, it can lead to less resilience, um, like um, the example that I mentioned with the smart cities. If something is then breaking, then nothing works anymore. So one needs to go for fair uh, algorithm, explainable AI algorithms, and also consider really AI ethics in, the, in, this, in this context. So three take home messages from this talk, I hope. Um, first of all, climate extremes really matter. So concrete climate seems not only the mean temperatures. And in particular, hydrometeorological extremes, we see again and again, uh, at least for ecosystems, that this is a key, one of the key drivers. Then the systemic effects, cascade and compound uh, events matter. And on the other hand, they are also hard to model, but this is really what we have to do. And AI may help in many aspects, but please with care. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting talk. And I will definitely have a look into the data set you mentioned that uh, I didn't know it. <laughs> and OK, so the floor is open to uh, for questions. Uh, you can type them into the chat, or you can raise your hand, and uh, then <laughs> you and you can Otherwise, I, I will start because I, I have a lot of questions. Um, so uh, I will start. So um, you mentioned so often causality. So you have so, so many causal relationships. And I, I am always wondering to which extent do we need to model causal relationships? Because when I, when I think of, uh, I don't know, I want to know something about Germany or Europe. Do we, to which extent can we quantify how much uh, causal relationships from the outside we need to integrate? Yeah, oh, that, that's of course very, uh, uh, very important, uh, very important point. Um, um, one, uh, so the, let's say the classical AI just exploits at the end associations and correlations, uh, um, but if you want to, see how interventions actually work. We do need causal um, causal modeling. And there are two ways. I mean, one is really causal inference from the data, which is also a very um, active research field with, with many different methods developing. I mean, Jakob Brung had, had a, um, actually a perspective paper, same time as our, our paper on deep learning. Um, so that is, that, is, uh, that is one way. And I think it's really, really important, but it's also a hard task. I think there have been, for example, studies uh, with respect to COVID uh, and um, what kind of mechanisms actually help, really help. And there are so many confounding factors, but one has also so many states and so many different conditions that one could hope. But what I hear is that this is still a big, a big challenge um, to really get causal models. But, but yeah, I agree, it's very important. And then the other thing that you mentioned is um, to also <clears throat> exploit 
causal knowledge that we already um, know before, and that leads then into into hybrid uh, modeling that I didn't discuss here because I wanted to go a little bit more into the societal uh, way here with this um, with this seminar series. Um, um, but that is definitely important to to combine physical modeling or actually process-based modeling or system modeling with, uh, with with machine learning to get uh, the best of both, both worlds and um, get the synergy between them. Yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> okay, so the next was uh, Jochen von Braun, then Jürgen Kuscher, and there was a question in the chat. Uh, so Jochen, you can start. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you, great talk. Um, my question relates to uh, modeling trade-offs. Um, when you think of uh, 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 big risks, extreme events, um, let's say you consider from an economic and people perspective, three options. Um, insurance, um, which actually may uh, foster risk, beha risky behavior. Um, investing in technology for adaptation or investing in mitigation. Um, and uh, so um, what can you say about modeling trade-offs and synergies rather than um, observing causalities here and there? I'm pressing you towards policy modeling, thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly really uh, outside a bit of my my my, um, my field, <laughs> but um, I think that's why I showed actually the slide uh, with this actor uh, agent-based modeling, uh, which I think is is an important uh, tool to uh, model these trade-offs and potential trade-offs. I mean, of course, it's hard to make them predictive, um, but there are first um, ideas to do that. And and yeah, you're right. There are these three <clears throat> different. Um, uh, strategies mm, and one thing for example that I, I know from studies from uh, Stefan Halgat for example you can also look at data and, and, and see how certain things um, if you monitor um, certain actions and for, for example what they found is that again precautionary action so like adaptation with foresight pays off also a lot um, I think also by a factor of more than three so this is more and more is basically better than just insuring things because it will be cheaper, cheaper at the end. And, and then of course, uh, yeah, and then of course mitigation. Um, of course, you know that also that um, mitigating later will also cause uh, higher costs. I mean, that's what the economists um, say. Um, and in this sense, um, mitigation is, is probably the priority but then um, we need also to adapt. I mean, th there's no, no way that the climate will not, uh, will not change. Um, so it, yeah, at the end, you're right, it's an economic uh, trade-off and not only economic, but also in general societal. And, um, and uh, I can't really tell you how, how it would be uh, perfectly modeled, but I do think the system modeling and the agent-based modeling approach um, is, is a fruitful one. I don't know what you think. <laughs> I think um, um, it would be great to connect what you have told us to, uh, to socioeconomic models. Um, and the agent-based models um, often lack um, uh, clear trade-offs and objective functions. They are, they are nice to, to see um, what behavior leads to what, but uh, um, the underlying investment calculus, which I hinted at for these three options, uh, I think needs a, a sound economic modeling base. Connected and, and, and to your wonderful that. AI stuff. Yeah, well, you need, and you need data to, to integrate the modeling um, with, with, with the data, because otherwise I always say models without data are fairy tales and data without models are chaos. And so bring them together and make models that, um, that uh, map um, the behavior that we have seen in the past, I think is, is, is an important point here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like the <this> saying. <laughs> okay, uh, Jürgen Kuscher, you 
have a question. Yeah, uh, actually, it I think it, it connects quite nicely. I mean, bringing bringing models and data together um, is probably the way to go. And of course, we have this uh, huge amount of of data from of observation centers. On the modeling side, <clears throat> the problem that I see very often when you talk to modelers, everything depends on the scale in the model. And it depends on things like process representation. And then you end up with many, many models. I mean, think of the, uh, I mean, think of the, of the models that people use for the IPCC scenarios. But um, so can I, can, can machine learning help us to somehow um, deal with the, with the problem that, that we always have a certain scale and this is, of course, related to the numerical complexity of physical models. Can we go to the subgrid scale? With yeah. machine learning? Okay, so maybe I, uh, it's interesting, I actually, I skipped all that part. So I, 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 was, so I, I, can, I can show you, I mean, this, this is really, I mean, this is also at the heart of my own scientific interest, how to combine machine learning with, uh, with modeling. I think you see, yes, I just gave a talk on the, big um, data from, from space conference where this was more topic. I didn't want to repeat this, um, but yeah, but and, and one of the strategies that we actually have there uh, or that we propose there is actually this so-called hybrid uh, modeling um, where um, the situation is that in a system model uh, that is depicted here, so with sub-model one and sub-model two, we, uh, we actually don't necessarily know all the processes and particularly as we mentioned at, at different scales very well. And so the idea is if we are, we, if we don't have a good theory or not good uh, scaling, then replace <clears throat> such a sub model with, with, with a machine uh, learning approach and put the output of this machine learning approach into, into, into the next sub model that is then again more strongly uh, more strongly physical, and and the same thing is actually true for for this parameterization. And you you mentioned subgrid processes. Um, it's again more the field of the atmospheric scientist. By actually uh, here's 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 actually a kind of slide where um, we have the problem that in a global climate model, um, this heterogeneity of the clouds in this case with convection and so on is is represented. Um, just by one grid cell, and and uh, and so the question is how one can describe the, the effective properties of such a grid cell, and what people do um, is uh, run actually models, for, for example, areas uh, with very high resolution, and then try to learn with machine learning the mapping from this very high resolution where the physical processes can be resolved to the coarse grid, and in this sense, learn the parameterizations uh, uh, which, which determine the, the mapping from fine to coarse using uh, this data rich but simulated data in this case, and in this case, uh, <clears throat> data rich um, approach with, with uh, machine learning. I don't know, I that maybe that, that answered your question, but yeah, totally. I mean, the, this integration of, of models and data and, and using machine learning in, uh, is, is, is very important. Um, and maybe I have, should have change the, the talk a bit <laughs> to emphasize this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Jan, you have a question. Yeah, I find that topic uh, extremely exciting. Uh, I've been in several projects where people try to link biophysical models to economic models, and I'm about to be in a new one led by Jürgen, who just asked the previous question. And, and I'm wondering whether this idea that you propose is a hybrid model, let's say, where you, within some biophysical model, substitute parts that don't work well with the machine learning approach could actually also work for that goal. And because we have, as economists, we often have that problem that we, we, we need to optimize. And uh, to optimize over a biophysical model, we need uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of iterations. But these models sometimes take a day to run. Yeah, so uh, no way you can optimize that. Um, so is there a way to maybe generate data sets uh, from these biophysical models and then use machine learning to basically create a meta model um, for that particular purpose? And then 
which runs much faster than the actual model. So basically also use the two couple models. Is that something that you have been aware of or seeing or doing or at least could? Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that that is actually, um, certainly this is, this is one, one important thing that's basic model emulation uh, where, you, where you emulate, for example, this case a biophysical model and try uh, and, and, uh, and speed it up by that. Um, and that's, for example, done a lot uh, also in, in remote sensing for retrieving or for simulating the atmospheric transfer of radiation, which is also pretty complicated and can take a lot of time and approximate that with, uh, with a machine learning approach. Um, so I, I think um, I have, I'm not aware that this has been really done in, in, in um, the context of um, uh, ec economic modeling or coupled e economy uh, biophysical modeling, but actually we are proposing something similar in a more climate related modeling um, project that is starting um, this, this summer. So maybe we can talk. <laughs> I, I would be interested. Mm -hmm. Great, let's talk. <laughs> uh, that sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, are there further questions? Otherwise, I, I have a question related to this because I mean I'm I'm also a lot of, uh, I'm I'm very con uh, concerned or I'm addressing also my group always um, questions where we want to combine machine learning with knowledge we have because in, in I mean in agriculture or economy wherever you you work in you have uh, knowledge and I've. I have the feeling that in machine learning and AI, especially for generative models, this is lacking or there's no, uh, uh, so far there's no clear uh, research direction how we can account for this. You, um, at, at one slide you showed conditional guns, so uh, which are really good in generate a scenario in the future or how uh, something will look like when you when you add a, a specific environmental factor but i'm i'm wondering how can you account for physical consistency or scientific even scientific consistency in such models so i don't see this yet in research now, yeah um so uh, the the the, hi the hybrid uh, modeling is a little bit exactly uh, trying to address this this um, this issue. I don't know if, if you um, so. Uh, okay, sorry if I <laughs> to another example, uh, but I think since obviously you're uh, all, all very interested in the <laughs> in this part. Uh, um, it was just for the for the generation. It's for classic. Yeah, okay, for the generation. I think, but these are I think two different questions. So one is uh, okay. I think one part is so. For example, we have here a hybrid global hydrological model, um, which where we have the basic physical equations. In this case, pretty simple water balance equation. Like here, the groundwater is updated with some. Um, uh, from the old state with the base flow is subtracted, the recharge is added, and so on and so forth. So really, uh, equation that makes sure that everything is physically consistent and the mass is conserved. Uh, and then we have a neural network that, for example, tells um, us how the precipitation channels into the different compartments. So here we have um, um, this alpha QF, so how much is runoff Quickly, how much is recharging the soil moisture, and the third one is uh, how much is recharging the groundwater. These through the softmax, for example, they all will uh, be between one, and, or they will add a, add to one. So it's physically clear; um, it will be adding up to one. Uh, and then it, we make sure that there is no, uh, no no hiccups that can happen with a pure uh, statistical model which doesn't know any physics. So that's really the idea of, of the hybrid modeling. But then the second question is. And I think that's an important one, and I'm, I'm actually at yesterday discussion how, how we deal with it better is uncertainty and probabilistic uh, modeling in, the, in this context. Um, and I think we need a unification of, of this approach and Bayesian uh, un, un, uncertainty modeling. Um, but I, I don't have an answer really how it can be done. But they're actually nice uh, work. Now, Yarin Gal is uh, doing stuff there, and. Um, uh, I forgot the other name now, but yeah, 
it is it is an important question, but I don't have a good uh, good answer and um, how to do it in a generative way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's an uh, important way to go, but I, I'm... Um, because it's even not clear what are physically consistent distributions. Do, you know, do we know if a certain correlation structure is physically meaningful or not? I mean, at this point, I think uh, there are so many uh, areas, maybe explainable machine learning can also come into play where we just uh, search for patterns uh, where we don't know yet that they are physical, consistent, or maybe AI can help us to, to find uh, rules uh, of physical yeah. rules which are not okay. known to us yet, or to just to formalize them and find new definitions. And I, I think that's, uh, yeah. uh, as you pointed out, uh, we should go in the direction of uh, uh, that there's an interplay between uh, knowledge we already have and uh, machine learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is equation discovery and these kind of things. That's, that's another think, aspect here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, are there any uh, further questions? Otherwise, I would say thank you again. Very interesting talk. I think uh, we will get back to you um with further questions or discussions or that we want to um yeah discuss any any topics uh further in this direction that would be nice. mm -hmm. thanks again to the audience i hope you had a uh, good time i i found it was really interesting and see you for the next uh, lecture series talk and have a good week bye bye Bye, thank you. Thanks everyone.